just as a yeah go ahead bill i'm going to start recording and we're going to go around and have, find out how everybody's doing and then bill we'll turn this over to you in about 10 minutes or so sure and then uh, let's start with you laura um how are you and ray doing ray and i are doing pretty well now um you can take me off the prayer list for my leg apparently when they found the uh pitch nerve in my back as arthritis that took care of that pain plus I, am, I still am on pain medication for it in case there's a problem but there's a big problem with Ray's uh, Ray's niece's husband his niece is Amanda Taylor she's married to Ricky Taylor he's been having problems for several weeks uh, started with him breaking his hip and then he got double pneumonia and now he has been uh, diagnosed with ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And this is causes the fluid to leak into the lungs. And uh, he is, and therefore it makes it real difficult to breathe. He is on oxygen, uh, he is unconscious. Mm -hmm. So we may be making a trip to North Carolina soon. And what was the first Hopefully name? not, but please pray for Amanda. And Ricky. Ricky. And is Ricky that has the problem or Amanda? It's uh, Ricky, Ricky, the husband of his niece. Right. Okay. All right, we'll do. We'll certainly do that and keep us posted on that. Safe travels if you have to go. Joyce, uh, you and Ken are about to take a trip coming up too, aren't you? Yes. Um, we're going to um, uh, South Dakota to the Badlands to see, and to see Mount Rushmore. We're gonna take a week and do that area. Good, good. Well, you guys so, have safe, safe travels on that. You guys doing all right though? Thank, yes, we are. We're doing well. How was your granddaughter? Um, she went back to the doctor and <clears throat> they put uh, like a, a metal brace uh, that wraps around the front uh, of her her two teeth. Um, and they told my daughter they now had to see, and uh, I can't remember, entodontist? Ontodontist? Orthodontist. Yeah. I'm Not an orthodontist. Not an orthodontist. Uh, something else that I guess because they're not sure about one of the teeth. Oh. Um, whether it's going to live or die. So, mm. okay. anyway. Well, I hope they're able to save it. <laughs> yes. Jim and Kay, how are you guys doing? We're doing well, except for the allergies. Yes. <laughs> well, this looks good, though. <laughs> 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 That's good, Jim. I like that. I like that. It's great to see you guys. J uh, Jerry, how are you doing? I am fine, thank you. Just this morning, I was thinking about how thankful to God I am to have you two, that you have brought us through this, you have kept us together, and it, then technical difficulties this morning, once again, thanks to God. I mean, I, I am just, and if you haven't it again it's beautiful be sure to keep Kleenex because I kept crying every time Lee Curl said something so yes. <laughs> plenty, you, you'll need Kleenex okay yes. <laughs> but I'm fine thank you that was a good service Anna you're muted right now but how are you doing great I'm just glad you all are doing well yeah, well, we are, we Thank are. You. And Anna, speaking of you, since you and I are on the Belong team together, we're recording the, uh, or the Compass class is supposed to be recording Mark Wingfield. Mark's teaching outside of his class for about the first time in 20 years. At any rate, there, he, he is teaching on some things that might help us on the Belong team, so they're going to record that for us today. Okay. So that's good. Diana, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, all my people made it back home safely, and uh, my parents are taking another trip this week to pick up a new puppy. So uh, we probably need to pray for my parents and their dogs because that's gonna be quite an adjustment. <laughs> now, did they came, they came here for surgery for the dog, right? Yes, so they got surgery for their younger dog by 
Right. And then they're getting a new puppy this week. They have a notion that they now want three dogs. So um, yeah, anyway, I'm kidding about that. Um, it is definitely a praise that they made it back safely though. So they're back in yes. Santa Fe. They're back in, yeah, Santa Fe. back in Santa Fe. And the boys are back in, in Nashville. Boys are back in Nashville. Tanner starting his college orientation process. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's great. That is great. And you doing all right? I'm doing well. Thank you very right. much. We're good. Bonnie, how are you and Robert doing? We're doing very well. Thank you. Uh, we have one thing we're going to leave tomorrow to go to Broken Bow, Oklahoma, to meet up with our Baton Rouge family for a couple of days. So safe travels for them and for us. All right. Looking forward to it. Okay, very good. Oklahoma, both Oklahoma, fantastic, fantastic. And uh, Bill, how are you? And Charlotte, how are you guys doing? Charlotte, you on the top? We're good. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell, Charlotte, you must be upstairs. I saw Bill looking up. Uh, I am. <laughs> or he always, maybe he always looks up to you. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ha, ha. <laughs> That's it. I like it. I like it. Well, Travis and Patty, how are you guys doing? We're super. Yeah, we're doing well. Thank you. Matthew, uh, being in town, our son, um, we had a belated Mother's Day celebration at my mom's house yesterday. That was really nice. Wonderful. Aww. Got to hug her for the first time in a year and a half. Wonderful. Aww. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. That's fantastic. Don and Barbara, how are you guys doing? Now, Barbara, you went to, to Detroit, right? Right. We're doing well. Thank you. And thank you so much for your prayers while I was gone. It was a really meaningful week. And um, so Glenda is in no pain, which is just such a blessing. And Clyde, who I think was aware there was a room in their home where food was prepared, is now cooking. Wow. And he's a criminal lawyer. So I am so proud of him. He and I have been <laughs> close friends since we were in college and um it's just he's a great caregiver and uh if you all will continue to pray for Seglinda and Clyde I'll appreciate it okay Don and I are great all right Seglinda and Clyde very good and, and um Alice how about you how are you doing I'm doing super I forgot to tell you all Sally says thank you very much for uh, praying for every week. She's very appreciative. And, and Sally's doing, she's able to maintain or how's she doing? She's doing okay. Uh, she has good days and bad days, but they're, it's, it's getting better. We're teaching her how to drive again. Okay. Well, that's, she's lucky to have a friend like you. Can't under, understate that. We lost Sandra. Okay, Sandra just got lost. Maybe she'll come back in. <laughs> uh, just remember, this is our last Zoom. We'll be in, in the room next week. So uh, Laura and I are going to try to go down on Tuesday to see how many of our books of the Bible are still up on the wall. And we'll <laughs> see if we can put back as many as we can. And uh, we'll, we'll just, it's going to be a little different. And it's going to be a 45-minute total. Here comes Sandra again. It's going to be a 45 minute total from start to end, you know, so we start at 10 and we have to get out at 1045. And uh, I saw on the list, Anna and, and uh, Diana, it sounds like you guys are jumping in and doing childcare right at, on that very first day. It's very, very, very nice of you guys to do that. Everybody's fully vaccinated, right? Say it again. Everybody's fully vaccinated, right? I think so. I, yeah. I can't think of anybody that's not. What's the hugging protocol? <laughs> uh, I think we go for it. We may, we, we may I'm a fist, hugger. We may do fist bumps and hugs. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But uh, okay, yeah, that's it. And y'all uh, got any uh, food requests? I'm gonna try to kick my baking back in. <laughs> okay. Oh man, that's a lot to take on the first week, Diana. And go, I'm Jerry. A year and a half to make up for, man. Yeah, Jerry, go ahead. I'm gonna send you a chat. So that I don't take up time. I'm going to send you a chat. I'm just telling you, giving you a thumbs up. Oh, a chat. <laughs> oh, a chat. Okay. And Sandra is on. Sandra's back. Okay, good, Sandra. Sandra, we were just talking about coming back next week. You will be uh, in their classroom next week. So uh, I know. I'm so glad. That'll be different. That'll be great. And uh, anyway, okay. All right. I think we're ready, Bill. I'm going to mute everyone. You need to unmute yourself.
Um, and then uh, we'll unmute as we need to read for you or talk or whatever. So I'm gonna mute everyone. And now Bill, if you'll unmute yourself, you've got the floor. Can you see how to do that, Bill? Let me see, I, did, I, I think I made a big mistake. Bill, it should be under, um, on your lower left-hand corner of your screen um, on, uh, yeah, Charlotte's coming down, tech support's coming down the stairs. There you go. There you go. Right. Thank you, you got it. Let me say that I am sorry that I was not able to teach earlier in the year when I was scheduled to but I spent six days in the hospital with COVID pneumonia. And uh, my voice is still not back to normal. And so if you have a Bible and will turn to Romans five, uh, I may ask some of you to read that it will help me with my voice management. And so, let me begin by saying this whole section of scripture deals with the issue of sanctification. Now, uh, let me define the term sanctification. Uh, sanctification is the call to put off the old self and put on the new self. And it is really all about growing as a Christian. I would remind you that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people became a Christian on one day. And then they went back to their home countries. They were all gathered in Jerusalem from various countries. They went back to their home countries and began to share their experience with other people. And there was tremendous growth in the early church during this time. But they didn't have any mentors. They didn't have a Bible. The Bible wasn't, was not going to come into existence for almost 300 years. And so they had no way to grow as a Christian. No one to help them. And so Paul is writing this letter to the Roman Christians to help them understand what their conversion experience was all about and to help them grow in their faith. And uh, so with that in mind, let's take a look at uh, Romans 5, 12 to 21. And I would remind you that we'll go through these passages rather quickly. But if you have questions about any verse in that passage, we'll answer those questions and deal with those before we move on to the next passage. So I will read Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, just as though one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, that is Adam, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulted in condemnation. But on the other hand, 
the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For by the transgression of the one, that is Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, as though one transgression were resulted con in condemnation to all men, even so, through the one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sin sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And the law came in that transgression, might receive, might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in summary of what we've just read, Paul was reminding them that we all became sinners because of the sin of Adam. But we can all become righteous through the life of Jesus. And uh, so that, that's what he's laying the frame, the groundwork in this passage, saying we are now Christians. And then he's going to go on and explain where we go from here since we've become a Christian. Now, any, any question about any of the verses that we've just read? Um, Bill, so when they say justification, they mean righteousness? Yeah, justification. That word can mean righteous. It can mean sanctification, but the idea is because Jesus died, we have been justified. Uh, we can become justified through his death. Okay. Any other questions about that passage? <clears throat> All right, can we have someone read 6, 1 through 14? Yeah. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old, out, old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin, to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to, to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. 
for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. All right, All right. this is a really beginning to deal with the issue of sanctification, uh, saying that if we've died to sin, then we are alive to God in Christ. The issue here is that we have to keep dying to sin. It's not a once and for all issue. It is a continuous issue of dying to sin. And so a lot of the new Christians were still sinning and they were sinning with the understanding that grace covers their sin. And so if they sin more, then they'll experience more grace. And Paul was saying, no, 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 <laughs> that's not the issue. You don't sin to keep experiencing grace. You die to sin and live to God. And you got to keep dying to sin to live to God. Any questions about that passage that Laura just read? I want to ask a, a question about the passage you read. And okay. Then, and then this leads into Laura's, I think. But the um, so big picture wise, he's saying before the law was there, nobody. I mean, you you were you were there was there was no sin is that what, or is that what was being said in that first passage or you did, what, what's being said there bill he, he was saying that the law made you aware of sin sin was there right. but people were not aware that it was that they were sinning just like a child a child does wrong but they don't re, they don't necessarily realize it's wrong until they're made aware that it's wrong. Right. So, so I, I, yeah. I, I, that helps a lot. Now, now Bert, I think Bert were on today. They're, I think they may be out as well, but the uh, he's always looking for real world application. So those in other countries or whatever, I mean, I use Africa as, as the example, who don't know um, are, are, are not condemned because they haven't received the word or the law or the, or the, the news, the good news about Jesus, I guess. Would you say that? That's about my pay grade. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't imagine God sending a person to hell who's not aware of the fact that they've sinned uh, any more than a child, a baby dies. I can't imagine that baby not going to heaven. And um, I can't imagine a person who's not aware of sin being condemned for that sin. And, uh, but thankfully we don't make that decision. It's God who, who does, but it's beyond my comprehension to believe that God would not be gracious. Uh, he is love after all. Thank you. All right. Any other questions about either of these two passages? All right. I'll read uh, chapter six, verses 15 to 23. Uh, this passage deals with the victory over sin. So chapter six, verses 15 to 23. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed and having been freed from sin you became slaves of righteousness 
I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of the flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul is using the imagery of slavery here because they were all familiar with it. Uh, many, many who were coming to Christ were slaves. And so he was using an image with which they were very familiar. And he was saying, if you were disobedient to your master as a slave, you'd have to pay for it. But if you're obedient to your master, then you'll be rewarded for it. So he's using this imagery here to say you have been freed from sin. You're no longer a slave to sin. If you become a slave to Christ, that'll reduce your idea of wanting to sin. Any questions about that passage? All right, we'll move on to chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Who would like to read 7, 1 through 6? I will. All right, good. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime? Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. In the same way, my friends, you have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we are slaves not under the old written code, but in the new life of the spirit. All right, Paul is switching imageries here he's switching from the imagery of slavery to the imagery of marriage and showing that uh, if we are true to christ it's like being true to your husband or wife but if your husband or wife dies you're free then to marry someone else and so he's using imagery here to try and help these new christians understand that they are not bound by the law. Uh, any questions about that passage? It, it's really about a warning about legalism, uh, which is often a pattern of trying to become a better Christian. Uh, you know, we often try to become a better Christian by rules and regulations, the thou shalt nots of life. But legalism is really not the way to grow as a Christian. Um, I'm reminded of a friend of ours. Charlotte is really a better friend to Mary Kay than I am. Mary Kay Higginbotham Parrish 
is the probably the nation's outstanding arranger of handbell music. We were in college together. And by the way, next time the handbells uh, perform in church, look and see who arranged that handbell music. It's probably Mary Kay. Well, I did the wedding for Mary Kay and John Parrish, her husband, in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And they had a wonderful swimming pool in their backyard. Mary Kay's mother loved to swim. And so when Mary Kay's mother was in her mid to late seventies, she came to Shawnee for a visit with John and Mary Kay and got up one morning and said, Mary Kay, I wanna go swimming. And Mary Kay said, but mom, why don't you go to the OBU pool? Oklahoma Baptist University pool. Said, we've got a nice pool at the university. Mary Kay, of course, worked. She and John both worked at the university. Mary Kay taught music. John was one of the vice presidents. So Mary Kay's mom went to the pool. She had on a robe. And when she took off her robe, the young college student lifeguard said, oh, I'm sorry, you can only swim here in a one-piece bathing suit. Mary Kay's mom had on a bikini. And so the young man said, you can only swim here in a one-piece bathing suit. And Mary Kay's mom said, well, what, which piece do you want me to take off? Uh, you see, legalism has its boundaries. And I can remember when we were living in Siloam Springs, Arkansas, that a good friend that I'd grown up with, Sue Tchaikovsky, <clears throat> was the Dean of Women. And now this was during the days of the mini skirts. And uh, the university, John Brown University is a very, very conservative Christian school. And so one of Sue's responsibilities as Dean of Women was to stand at the front door of the women's dorm and the girls had to get down on their knees and the skirt had to be as low as her knees. And so the girls would hike the skirt down as low as they could get it so it was below or to the knees. And then when they walked out the front door, they would hike the skirt back up halfway between the knees and the hip. And legalism means well, but Paul is saying here, that's not the way to go. We're free from the law. We are committed to Christ like a husband is committed to a wife or a wife is committed to the husband. Any other questions about that passage? Bill, it seems like Paul, the Pharisee, you know, this, this is right up his alley with the law and all that sort of thing. But it seems like, you know, originally, as I understand it, I think we've been really hard on the Pharisees, but the, as I really understand it, they were trying to boil down the law so the common man could understand what to do and what not to do. And then things got added and added and added. And after a while, the law became everything. And that's kind of what it is. And so I think today we do similar things. We, we, you have to jump this high or you're not a Christian or you're not as good a Christian as you should be or whatever. So I think we give them a hard time, but I think it, like you say, it started off with good intentions, you know, to show people here's what, here's the do's and don'ts. But then, um, then the whole thing became in keeping the law and not worshiping, not, not, not with the relationship with God, but just trying to follow those rules. You're right on target. That is the, uh, Ten Commandments by the time of Jesus had expanded to 623 laws trying to explain those commandments. And uh, you can't get anywhere by the law. You've got to do it by grace. And so Paul is saying in this passage, you're free from the law. Uh, you're committed to Christ like a husband or wife is committed to each other. All right, let's look at uh, chapter 7, verses 7 through 13. 
chapter 7, 7 through 13. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved the res to result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteousness and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Now, that's deep stuff. And I wish we had time this morning to really get into that passage. In summary, I think Paul is saying we become aware of wrongdoing when we become aware of the law, showing that wrong is wrong. And he uses the example of coveting here when he said, I was uh, not aware that coveting was wrong until the law said, that it was wrong. And <clears throat> so in summary of this, he's saying that the law was good in that it helps us become aware of what wrong is. It's good, but it's inadequate is, is the thrust of that. Any questions about that passage? We're going to get to sanctification here in a few minutes. All right, would someone read 7, 14 to 25? Oh, yeah. This is about the powerlessness of the law. Go ahead. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer that I do it, but that sin dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer that, it is no longer I that do it, sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. Thank you. The Jews had the concept of every person being composed of two people. Inside each person, there is the desire to do good and the desire to do bad. And Paul is picking up on this old Jewish concept and saying, I struggle with the same issue. I want to do good, but I wind up doing bad. And when I do, I feel worthless. 
How can I be delivered from this inner conflict that's going on in me between wanting to do good and doing bad? And he concludes this chapter by saying, thanks be to God who delivers me from this struggle. And uh, any questions about that passage? He's reminding us that the law is powerless to deliver us from sin. All right. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who in, are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if the spirit you're putting, but if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For if you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to, to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul is simply returning again to the theme of saying to these new Christians, if you've got the Spirit of Christ, you're confident that you're one of God's children. But if you do not have the spirit of Christ, you doubt whether or not you're a child of God. Now, there is in our day, <clears throat> hopefully it's regressing, but there is in our day a type of preaching that makes people doubt whether or not they're children of God. And that type of preaching is usually done by people who want to see a number of baptisms in their church uh, by sowing seeds of doubt about whether or not you're really saved. Um, I was visiting my Aunt Bonnie, uh, Aunt Lydon, 
in Oklahoma City one morning, and I was pastor at First Baptist Church in Abilene. And uh, Aunt Lotta had fixed a good breakfast, and I was at one end of the table, and her husband, Harold, was at the other end of the table. And Aunt Lotta says to me, Billy Glenn, is your church spiritual? And I said, well, Aunt Lida, how do you determine if a church is spiritual or not? Uh, she was a member of First Southern Baptist Church in Dell City, Oklahoma. And she said, well, my church is spiritual. And I said, well, how do you determine that, Lida? And she said, well, we won't give out food or gas money or help people with their electric bills unless they are baptized first. And uh, her old atheist husband said, good Lord, Lida, you've been baptized five times and that preacher still don't know your name. <laughs> uh, that, there is that type of preaching that says, are you sure you're a Christian? And Paul is saying here, if you exhibit the spirit of Christ, you are one of his. And if you don't exhibit the spirit of Christ, you're not one of his. Now, remember, Paul's writing to people who are really baby Christians. And they have no help in knowing how to grow in their faith. Now, we'll conclude this with chapter 8, verses 18 to 30, the new hope. Is there someone who would read 8, 18 to 30? <clears throat> I will then, and hopefully my voice will hold out. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Well, that's an interesting verse. Uh, it says that the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, it's like childbirth. Everybody's waiting eagerly for that child to be born. And Paul saying all of creation is waiting eagerly for the glory that's to be revealed in us. Not just humans, but all of creation. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Well, that's a beautiful passage. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, for the redemption of our body, for in hope. We have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we will wait eagerly for it. So Paul's talking here about the hope in Christ Jesus. And I want to ask quickly if there are any questions about that and then wrap this up all right i said at the very beginning three thousand people have been converted on the day of pentecost and they had no idea 
how to grow in Christ. And Paul's trying to help them with this by saying, you're still going to sin, you're still going to war within yourselves, but ultimately, you know you're a child of God if you ex exhibit the spirit of Christ. So he was trying to help them grow in the doctrine of sanctification or growth in Christ. I would remind you that shortly after Paul wrote this, the monastic group arose. That is, people began to go off in the desert and live by themselves, trying to get away from sin, trying to concentrate on becoming a better follower of Jesus. And then after the desert, mothers and fathers, they began to group together in monasteries, hoping to become more like Christ by encouraging one another and living together. Now, in this country, sanctification came about in the first half of the 19th century. The second great awakening happened around 1812. And there, were, there was a great revival in the country. Uh, one of the most famous preachers in that second great awakening was Jonathan Edwards, known for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And uh, I mean, Jonathan Edwards could make, like, make you feel like God was going to throw you out of his hands and let you burn in hell forever. And that was the type of preaching that brought about fear and trembling and many conversions. Well, John Wesley was one of those preachers. But John Wesley began to see that like right after Pentecost, all of these people were being baptized, but they were not growing in their faith. So Wesley developed a system to try to help people grow in their faith. Believe it or not, the Pentecostal holiness movement came out of John Wesley's teachings about how to become a better Christian. And all of us have been aware of Pentecostal holiness people who didn't feel like Wesley had gone far enough, so they started a different movement, Pentecostalism. Now, there are some wonderful Pentecostal people, and don't hear me as being all that judgmental on Pentecostal people because they some of them really are wonderful Christians. But much of the move towards sanctification in the Pentecostal movement is legalistic. And just as Paul warned about legalism in this passage, uh, we must be aware that legalism, wearing your hair in a bun, not wearing jewelry, wearing long dresses. You know, that really is not the way necessarily to become a better Christian. Uh, now, after World War II, people were aware of death. The soldiers who were coming home had faced death often. And their mothers and fathers and husbands and siblings had all been so aware of death because their brother or son was fighting overseas and was in danger of dying. And so after the war, preaching focused on escaping death, hell spending eternity away from God. And as a result of that, many, many people came to faith in Christ. 
Most of you are too young to remember the Southern Baptist emphasis, a million more in 54. All we wanted to win a million people to Christ. And there was a lot of evangelism that took place in the late 40s and the early 50s. What did we do to help those people who were new Christians grow in their faith? I was baptized twice because I had no help in growing in my faith. So I wondered, man, am I really a Christian? I was baptized again. It's my opinion that what's needed in the contemporary church more than anything else is to help people become more like Jesus. And uh, I think if we do that, evangelism, wholesome evangelism, will take place and Christians will be a lot happier in their faith. Sorry that I've gone over here, Jonas, uh, but we have a lot of scripture to cover this morning. It's back to you. Thank you, Bill. We appreciate it. Thank you, Charlotte, as well. I'm glad you guys both joined. We had uh, Robert joined us uh, after we after we started. Robert, are you doing okay? Robert, are you there? Are you doing okay? Okay. And then I had one question for you, Alice, before we pray. Um, Alice, how is, how is Art Foster doing? Alice, you're muted right now. So let's see. But we'll see. We can. Uh, he's doing as well as can be expected, I guess is the term. Uh, he's, he's, they're moving through this period. Okay. Still. The hospice has helped a lot. Okay. Very good. Thanks for asking. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else have anything to add before we pray? And Bill and Charlotte, thank you again so much. It's good to see everyone. Hope to see you in person next week. But anybody else have anything to add? Well, let's let's pray. And then I, uh, I hope you guys have a great day. Jeremy, Father, we thank you for this day and a time that we can study your word. We pray for Carrie Donaldson, who is under the weather, that she might be, get better. Better. We pray for Tracy Strudevant um, as he and his brother travel to Austin this weekend. We pray for Linda Gozer, who is uh, traveling to see relatives this weekend um, and help her to have safe return. We pray for Deborah Herford, as to who's received a pacemaker, that she might recover and to uh, be able to get back to um, her health. We pray for healing for Connie Smith, who's battling COVID-19 and has been in the hospital for months. We pray for Alice Wilhoy's brother-in-law, Art Foster, who had heart failure and is now in hospice. Give him peace and good last days. We pray for um, Seglinda and Clyde Pritchard, the friends of Barbara Floyd and Don uh, in Detroit. Um, just give them um, your peace and comfort. We pray for Alan uh, Stafford, who is recovering from heart surgery, for Diana Early's coworker, Pam Essler, as she's feeling a lot of pressure about her mom's new living situation. We are thankful for Diana's nephew, Tanner Watkins, and his three friends who've returned safely to Nashville. We pray for Joyce's granddaughter, Alicia, who has had surgery and hope that those permanent teeth are able to be saved. We pray for John Browns, as he is not doing well, um, and give him good last days. Uh, we pray for Linda's, uh, Linda Gelzer's uh, nephew, Brett, to give him uh, discernment for his future, for Anna and her Casa, Casa child, that uh, that adoption might take place by the grandparents, and for all children in foster care that are really having a much tougher time during the pandemic. We pray for Laura Snow's niece uh, and her husband, Andrea and Cook, as they're expecting a baby and moving to start a new church. Uh, for Alice's friend Sally, that uh, she can have peace and comfort with, as she battles brain cancer. We pray for uh, Ray's um, uh, Ricky, the niece of, um, of Amanda Taylor, or Ray's niece, Amanda Taylor, her husband, who is battling pneumonia and ARDS. And uh, thankful for Diana's parents making it safely home uh, and be with Robert and Bonnie as they travel to Oklahoma. Give us a good day today. We thank you for your many blessings. Help us to be your hands and feet in Dallas. And let me pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. See you next Sunday. Yeah. See you next Sunday. This is going to be good. Boy, it'll be, I'm going to have to get up early. <laughs> <laughs>
See you guys. Hope you have a great week. Bill, Bill and, and Charlotte, when are you guys headed home? Monday. Monday. Okay. Tomorrow. Yep. Safe travels to you guys. Thanks. That's wonderful. And Diana, we'll check on that book to make sure it's there. Our prayer book is going to be really necessary with that shortened Sunday school lesson. Talk to everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye.